think there. Okay. Welcome to Concepts in Risk Management. This is a Schenner's webinar. My name is Judy Mendoza. I'm in the Risk Management Department of Victor O. Schenner. I have been with Schenner for about 20 years. And prior to that, I was a regional claims manager handling claims against architects and engineers. So I learned a lot about what can go wrong, and now I think I have a much more fun job. Um, this course is an introduction to the concepts of risk management. We have many other courses available on our website that will go into more detail of some of what we're touching on today. So let us start with what is risk? Risk is the probability, well, one definition of risk is that risk is the probability of an unfavorable outcome. When we're discussing risk, there are two important things to consider. Firstly, remember that what's considered unfavorable is relative to what's expected. That's the reason that one of the most important risk management tools that you have is managing your client's expectations. If your client is expecting some level of service and you're providing a level of service that's slightly less than that, even if your level of service meets or exceeds the standard of care, if there is a gap between what you're providing and what your client is expecting, you're going to have an unhappy client. And unhappy clients can result in disputes and potentially claims and possibly even litigation. So it's really important to manage your client's expectation. And of course, the gap between expectation and outcome increases with the duration and complexity of the project. So it's a continuing effort. The second thing that you want to think about when we talk about risk is that what's considered unfavorable to one stakeholder may be considered favorable to another. For example, lower fees paid to a design professional or reducing construction costs may equate to higher profit for your client, but it may also result in claims against the design team and the contractors. So that's why it's so important to have a reasonable integration of stakeholder objectives. Um, and that starts by having contracts that fairly allocate risk and reward. Rem keep in mind, your projects are one-of-a-kind endeavors. And because the future is unknown, projects are inherently risky and the management of risk is essential, value-adding activity in any project undertaking. We try to manage risk, and that's what this webinar is designed to help you do, at, at least in terms of your professional practice. So we've defined risk. What is risk management? Um, risk management is the process of minimizing the probability and severity of an unfavorable outcome. Basically, we're trying to determine what's the chance that this is going to happen, and if it does happen, how much might it cost me? Um, fortunately, there is a conceptual framework for such a process, and a number of tools have been developed to support the rational allocation and management of risk. This is probably something that many of you do intuitively. When somebody comes to you with a new project, you go through a checklist in your mind of whether or not you want to take that project, and then if you do, how the fees that you're going to charge and the time allocations and all of that. But perhaps it's time to do it in a more structured manner, and that's what we're going to try to help you do today. So what we're going to look at today um, is this risk analysis, risk response, and risk control. Um, that Those are the, the process for minimizing the probability of an unfavorable outcome. Um, and these are overlapping and often repetitive steps. Keep that in mind. So these are the topics we're going to be going into today. It starts with the risk management model. Some of you may have seen this before. This can apply really to any undertaking that you're about to do. It starts with what are the requirements? What's the program you're being asked about? What constraints are there in terms of budget, schedule, et cetera? And what's the context? You know, legal, economic, um, political, all of that has to go into the mix of the inputs. And then when you get the inputs, you start doing the risk analysis part of it. Um, and that's where you start identifying and assessing, again, the probability and severity of the risk. Risk analysis is a problem-seeking activity. It involves, firstly, identifying the sources of risk applicable to the project. And we're going to look at them in today in terms of what we refer to as the seven key risk factors. Then we're going to have to assess the probable impact on the project. What is the chance it will cause a problem? And if it causes a problem, what might be the estimated cost of that problem? And we have a lot of st statistics available on our website that can help you with that. Um, Policyholders can go into our new Shinera School of Risk Management, and under benchmarking, you can look at firms that are similar 
to your size um, and the discipline that you're practicing in and even the location that you practice in and get a feel for what type of projects, for example, are causing the greatest problem, what parts of those projects are causing problems. Um, we've gathered statistics for over 60 years and there's just a ton of information available on that. So then after you've identified and assessed the risk, you, start a, you create a short list of the more problematic sources of risk that need specific responses. Remember, if you can't identify a risk, you can't manage that risk. And risk analysis involves an overt and continual effort to identify and pursue possible sources of risk while assessing their probable impact on the project. In theory, the sources of risk that could potentially impact a project are virtually infinite in number. But in practice, the number of statistically significant sources of risk is relatively small. Um, so in our experience of over 60 years, the primary sources of risk for most projects are represented by these seven key risk factors. And what we suggest that you might want to do is, as you're assessing each of these factors on a potential new project that you might be analyzing, think of them on a scale of, say, 1 to 10, with 1 being very low risk, 10 being very high risk. Or some of you may want to shorten that. Instead of 1 to 10, you can do a scale of low risk, medium risk, and high risk. Um, but what you probably want to do is identify each risk separately, and then at the end you can tally up all of the items and determine the overall risk for the project. We also have on our website an interactive risk management matrix, which you can find, which will walk you through this and give you even more detail than what I'm going to be able to go into today. If any of you have any trouble finding that, feel free to contact us. We can help you find it on our website. Okay, so the first... Um, risk that we're going to look at is the client. And that makes sense because the majority of claims against design professionals are made by the project owner, who in most cases is your client. And if they're not your client, then they are your client's client, probably. If you're working as a sub to a, another design, to a prime design professional, or if you're a sub to a design builder, at some point, the client is still the ultimate person that's going to be bringing the claims. We have a separate webinar that's going to go into much more detail about evaluating clients and projects, but for now we're just going to kind of take an over, a high overview of this. One thing to keep in mind is that clients spend a great deal of effort evaluating potential design professionals, and really that should be a two-way street. Client selection can help you minimize the chances of a claim. So what you want to look at is things like the client's track record with this and other types of projects, the availability and adequacy of funding for the project, the client's general attitude toward professional services, including the methods of compensation, litigation, and claims history. Talk to your colleagues. Find out if this is the kind of client who has sued every design professional that they've ever worked with. They're out there. You probably know who they are. What type of contract are they offering? Is it, um, are they willing to go along with your offering of an AIA or an EJCDC contract? We'll talk a little bit more about what those contracts are when we get into the contract part of it. Um, so is the client willing to accept your contract, or is it the kind of client who says, sure, I'll be happy to use your client contract, let me just have my attorney run one through it, and then it comes back with 20 pages of revisions, so you no longer have a, your contract, you've got now a client drafted contract. Um, how is the client treating you during the contract negotiations? This is kind of a good insight into how the rest of the project may go. If they're very, very unreasonable, um, that may be a time to assess the risk in a much higher manner. Also, why is the client hiring you? Um, are they hiring you out of respect? Do they, you know, do they seek you out? Do they want you to be their design professional? Or do they just need you, somebody to stamp and seal a permit that they're trying to get and they don't really care who they hire? Um, all of that is really important to look at. Um, you also want to think about what the type of client is that you're hiring. Because each type of client might result in a different, a different, different risk management response. For example, um, I think the first thing is, is it a sophisticated client or a naive client? And I'm not judging either, but they both have different risks and different ways they have to be handled. If it's a sophisticated client, you know, a big time developer who's done lots of projects, they may be trying, they may be very suave and sophisticated and trying to transfer all of their risk and responsibility away from themselves and onto the design team and the contractors. So you need to really review those contracts carefully and try to manage that as a risk. 
Um, on the other hand, you've got a naive client. You might have a naive client. Maybe it's um, a husband and wife who have never hired a design professional before. They're they're building their help, their ideal home, and they want your help. Again, nothing wrong with that, but they're going to need a lot more handholding, a lot more explanation of what's to be expected, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, so just keep that communication going. Communication is so important in managing your risks. You know, when we talked about, um, oh, well, also let me, other types of clients that you might want to consider, is it a public client or a private client? If it's a public client, then um, the funds may be limited. It may be difficult to get additional money if it was, say, it, it was a result of a bond being passed. So you need to know that because there might not be money if there need to be additional services provided. Is it a committee? For example, a church group or even perhaps that husband and wife team that I mentioned earlier. When you have a committee, your risk goes up a little bit because you have a number of different people who may have differing opinions of what they want. Um, and you have to determine in that situation, it's most important to have one person elected as the decision maker and the communicator with you. So you're not getting different input from a lot of different parties. For those of you who have done private residences, you've probably run across this. Um, document every type of decision that's made and who or, you know, ordered you to do that, make that decision, um, because all of that might come back to help you should a claim or a dispute arise down the road. The other problem with committees sometimes is that they, you know, people come and go. They, you're starting with one group of people, but by the time the project is underway, you might have different people who don't know the history. Um, does your client have strong ties to the community? How likely is that client to sue you? And you also want to make sure the client has clear project objectives. If it's not clear, it's hard to meet their expectations. This kind of reminds me of, an, of a, a fun claim that I remember reading about recently where um, an interior designer was retained by a very wealthy, powerful businessman, and that's not the person that you think I might be talking about, but he was, but the interior designer was being hired to help renovate his Palm Beach estate. And problems developed with an antique floor that had been removed from a French chateau and shipped to Florida. Um, it started buckling and there were water issues and it resulted in a $1.8 million demand against the interior designer. Investigation seemed to indicate that the water infiltration was coming from improperly installed doors, that there had been issues with the way the floor was shipped to Florida, and of course the Florida humidity was having an effect on it. It didn't help that the claim against the um, contractor who installed it um, was filed in France, but it was useless in the United States, so there was no contractor to go after, and the client was being very difficult to deal with. Um, and just refused to come down to any kind of realistic settlement. What they finally ended up doing was finding one of his many ex-wives, and this was the ex-wife that happened to be with him when they were in France looking at the original floor in the chateau, and she was willing to testify that um, the floor looked the same in France as it did when it got to Florida. That helped bring it into, you know, rationalize the the claim settlement, and it ended up settling for about $235,000 rather than the $1.8 million. Um, but, you know, these claims are still difficult. The, the interior designer ended up having to waive her $70,000 fee, and there was an additional $250,000 that was spent for legal and expenses. So, you know, you want to stay away from claims. They can be extremely expensive. I thought it would be interesting to just look at this graph because it does show that 62% of claims made against design professionals have been made by the project owner. So picking the right client is essential. Um, and evaluating your client, even if it's not the owner, if it's the, say, the design builder or the prime designer, you still want to go through an evaluation. Um, remember that dissatisfaction of the owner can lead to claims against the prime or the, or the design builder, and they're eventually going to tr trickle down to you anyway. And when you're a subconsultant, you have less control over managing the expectations of the owner, but you still have to try, especially if you see a problem that isn't being addressed by the prime or by the design builder. It's also interesting when you look at this graph to recognize that 9% of the claims were made by general contractors and another 2.5% by subcontractors. And then when you add in claims for work or bodily injury, you're at almost 78% of claims being made by the owners of the contractors on the project. And that's good news from a risk management standpoint because these are parties with whom you've got some kind of a relationship. 
There's not much you can do about claims that come from other entities, like non-worker bodily injury or third-party property damage. Um, but you can manage the risk of parties with whom you have a relationship, the owners and the contractors. The second thing you want to look at when you're analyzing risk is obviously the project. Some projects are riskier than others, and how you respond can help control risks. Um, again, we can help you with a lot of information that we have on based on your discipline and your firm size and your geographical location. Um, it's not surprising, for example, that for architects and engineers, houses and townhouses seem to be the you know come out as the number one type of project that creates claims um, than school projects. But for large engineering firms, they have more highway and um, bridges claims. So some of the things you want to evaluate when you're taking on a new project is, importantly, the scope of service. Um, we feel that a limited scope of service is more risky than not having than almost anything, um, because you're you're just out there enough that you've got some responsibility, but you may not be paying enough fees to really be doing the job that you need to do to meet the professional standard of care. So be very wary of limited scope, especially when it comes to like during the, the construction phase of the project. Um, you want to look at what laws and regulations are applicable to the project, the political profile of the project in the community. You know, is it a nuclear power plant in a residential area, or you know, is it an office building in a downtown area? The office buildings tend to be one of the less risky type of projects. We have a ton of claim studies available on our website for various. Um, disciplines, but also many different project types. So if you're kind of interested in the statistics that have been involved and some examples of claims involving specific project types, we have that available to you on the website. Um, you want to look at the project delivery method. Is this typical, the more traditional design bid build, or is it a design build? Obviously, if you're the design builder, you're going to have enhanced exposure for claims for bodily injury, property damage, and economic loss. You'll be responsible for construction means and methods and job site safety. More typically, the design professionals, though, are a subconsultant to a design builder. Will there be one general contractor or perhaps a construction manager and multiple prime contractors? Remember that the presence of a construction manager just adds another party. More fragmentation of the project delivery method kind of develops. Um, so, and multiple primes can increase scheduling and coordination issues. Something to keep in mind as you're evaluating the risk on that project. Another important thing is will the construction documents be completed prior to construction or will they be completed in stages while construction proceeds, otherwise known as fast track. Fast track projects tend to be riskier in that they often result in more claims than the more traditionally um, delivered method. You, of course, want to look at your firm. Um, one factor that design professionals have the most control over is your own firm. So you want to do a self-evaluation as to whether a project is one that your firm can manage um, when you're evaluating potential risks. So you start with things like what is your firm's capability and experience, including business and professional licensing? Um, is the project in your home state or is it perhaps in another state or even another country? Um, if it is, do you know the laws of those jurisdictions? Um, it's always important, we always recommend if you're doing a project in another state, you need to know, talk to an attorney in that state and find out what are the statutes of repose, what are particular legal issues that might be impacting you, and licensing issues. Do you have the right licenses to work on those projects? You want to look at the capacity. Um, do you have the staff and consultants available, available to perform the services in line with the project schedule? Um, are you too busy right now? I mean, that can, can kind of work either way. In good times, you may have so much work coming in that perhaps taking on a new project isn't one in which you can really provide the right attention that you need to. Um, and so you may not provide the, the standard of care that is required of you. Um, or perhaps you're understaffed uh, because either times are bad and you've had to let go people or you're understaffed just because there's, again, so many projects that you're working on. So you need to evaluate that. You also want to look and be sure you understand what your firm's insurance coverage is, the adequacy of your policy limits, the size of your deductible. These are factors to consider when you're making a final analysis on a potentially high-risk project. Um, you know, one formula that I 
I've learned about that I think is always very interesting is you might want to look at your firm and look at the team that you're willing to assign to a new project that's coming on and add up the number of years of experience of each member of the team and then divide that number by the number of team members. Um, and hopefully the resulting number will be five or greater. Basically, that's a fancy way of saying that, you know, you want to make sure you have a team that's got adequate experience. You don't want a team of all brand new people who may be very eager, but perhaps don't have the experience to take on this particular project. So you want to kind of average out at least five years experience for each member of your team. You want to look at consultants. It's important to remember that if you're the prime designer, you have what's known as vicarious liability for the, cons excuse me, for the consultants that you retain. Um, so it's very important that you analyze the past experience with a particular consultant. Is this a firm with whom you've worked before? And if you did, were you happy with their work? Did you respect each other? Did things go well? That's going to be a much lower risk than, you know, have you worked with the firm before and you've had problems with them? Um, are there, what's the availability of qualified consultants? And what is the consultant's reputation? You know, are they good? Um, have they done these kind of projects in the past? You also want to very importantly make sure that your cult consultant has adequate insurance. It's not unusual for us to see claims, and we have plenty of them in our, on our website, claim studies, where you might have like a $2 million claim against a prime designer who says, well, this isn't my issue. This is 100% the responsibility of my subconsultant. So they turn to the subconsultant and find out that that subconsultant, say, only has a $500,000 policy. They will pay the $500,000 policy, even assuming that it's all still intact as well. But the client still wants that $2 million. So guess who's going to be stuck paying the $1.5 million in additional costs? Um, so you want to make sure that your consultants are financially able to respond to their negligence and their liability. You know, and it's also important, if you're a subconsultant, you want to make sure that going uphill, even though you're not going to have vicarious liability for your client, um, reality is that when you're all thrown into a room together, when there's a claim and all of the design team is there and all of the contractors are there, if, in any, if a situation arises where the prime designer who may have a lot of liability but doesn't have adequate insurance, the shift of the plaintiffs may suddenly change to whatever your discipline is as a subconsultant. So you want to make sure that all the parties around you have adequate insurance, not just your firm and not just your subconsultants downstream. Um, it's also really important to have coordinated agreements between if you're this prime and the subconsultants, because if there's any ambiguity or conflict between your the terms of your contract with your prime your your prime agreement with the owner and then your agreement with your subconsultants the only people that are going to benefit from that are going to be the attorneys who are going to spend a lot of time fighting over which contract is going to rule um you know we see this especially in terms of having a subconsultant who might limit their liability to you um similar to the ex example I gave earlier of a subconsultant not having enough insurance what happens if you have a $200,000 claim against you that's 100% the fault of your subconsultant, but in their contract with you, they've limited their liability to $50,000. And if you're in a jurisdiction that upholds limitation of liability provisions and contracts, and again, you need to know that before you go into you know, whatever state you're working in. Not every state has, test has tested it. Some states have, however. So if you're in a state that has upheld that $50,000 limitation of liability, Legally, that may be all that client owes to you. And again, you're going to be in a position of having to pay the remainder to your client because the client still wants their $200,000 for their claim. So you want to make sure everything is coordinated. Um, the only way I would suggest getting a limitation of liability and allowing one from your subconsultant is if you have a corresponding limitation of liability in your prime agreement with the owner or the client. Um, then if they're all coordinated, there shouldn't be a problem. You want to, um, basically the golden rule is you want to deal with subs and approach your subs as you would want your client to treat you. You don't want to unfairly push obligations down to your sub consultants. You want to allocate risk fairly. That really should be the goal on every project. The other thing to kind of keep an eye out for is dealing with client selected and client controlled consultants. Um, clients often retain geotechs, for example, and surveyors. Um, 
and although they're retained by the client, you're you might be relying and often you know on on the information that they provide, and you're often coordinating your professional services with these client retained consultants. So you need to evaluate the potential risk of these parties as well, and make sure they have insurance, even if they're not your sub consultant. Be very wary of clients who force you to retain consultants that they select, because without doing a full evaluation yourself, you're still going to have vicarious liability for them if you retain them directly. Um, but you know, if you don't know anything about them, you shouldn't be retaining them unless you feel comfortable doing that. There's a you know, there's always the, the weighing the balance of if you're the prime, should you be retaining the subconsultants so that when you make the money for doing it and you have control over it, um, but you have more risk? And in some cases, it may be better if you can convince the client to retain these consultants directly. Again, when you're all in the room settling a claim, you still might end up having responsibility if they're not adequately insured it and really good, but it's better than if you retain them yourself in that particular situation. So just things to consider and evaluate before you move on. You also want to evaluate the time and budget. Um, is your fee adequate? Um, remember, if you get too little compensation, that can result in a tendency to take shortcuts. Um, that can lead to mistakes or lack of proper coordination and communication with consultants, with the client, or with contractors. You need enough fee to be able to pay your salaries and not have it affect quality. So you want to be realistic. You want to consider whether the fee covers your costs and your profits. Um, and are there provisions in the agreement for additional services? Most projects change not only during the design phase, but also during the construction phase. Um, and you want to be sure there's something built into that contract that allows you to get additional fee if there are changes to the scope of services. Uh, you want to make sure there's enough money in the construction budget and the project budget. And you want to make sure that the client understands that they're not the same thing. The project budget should include soft costs for things like fees and interest, etc. Um, again, if budgets are inadequate, the project may be abandoned or you may not be fully paid or litigation may result. Time. Um, rushing to complete with an unrealistically short deadline is obviously going to increase the likelihood of design errors and omissions, which may lead to construction defects and deficiencies. An unrealistically short construction schedule can also lead to construction defects and deficiencies. It might even eventually slow the project down as trades overlap in congested areas, adversely affecting efficiency. So be sure to evaluate carefully the time and budget that you're getting for this particular project. A sixth risk factor that you want to consider is the contractor. Contractors can and do file claims against design professionals. Now, whether they can do so directly against you depends on the laws of the jurisdiction that you're practicing in or that govern the contracts. Um, this has to do with whether or not there's something called an economic loss doctrine that prevents contractors from filing a claim directly against design professionals. Um, and most states are really doing away with that. But really, it doesn't matter. Regardless, contractor claims are going to either come directly to you or go through the owner and then flow down to you. If the contractor is, is alleging that there are delays and extra costs because of inadequate design or ambiguity in your contract documents, they will either make the claim against you directly or make it against the owner who will then turn around and make it to the design team. Um, now, the tricky thing about evaluating the contractor when you're thinking of taking on a new project is that you obviously don't always know who the contractor is at the time that you're negotiating with the client. So if you do know who the contractor is um, and it was a positive, you know, if you've worked with them before and it was a positive experience, that will greatly reduce the risk factor. Um, if you don't know who the contract is going to be, then you need to complete this part of the analysis once the contractor is known. Keep in mind, however, that the fact that the identity of the contractor is unknown increases the risk of proceeding with the project. The other thing that you want to look at is how the project will be awarded. Will it be a negotiated selection or competitive bidding? The competitive bidding process motivates contractors, unfortunately, to underbid projects. And then they have tremendous pressure to recover some of what was left on the table. And that can result in either cutting corners, making substitutions and change orders, um, or trying to get the money. If they can't get it from the owner, then they're going to try to get it from the design team. You need to manage your client's risk in this regard. If 
I think this is one of the reasons that school projects were so high on the list of difficult projects, and that's because when you're dealing with public schools, they're almost always a negotiation. Um, a com um, competitive bidding process and the low bidder gets the job and is then going to try to get additional money by change orders. And a, a good design professional, a good design team is going to prepare your client. And again, especially if you've got the more naive client who hasn't been through this and you need to evaluate that, you need to prepare them for the fact that this could be happening. And then when all these change orders hit their desk, and there are allegations that your design is inadequate, you can look at the owner and say, see, I prepared you for this. This is what we were expecting. And here's how we're going to deal with it. So um, again, managing your client's expectations is such an important part of managing risk. You also want to make sure that, you know, analyze once you find out who the contractor is, do they have sufficient experience with projects of similar size and scope and complexity? Has the contractor demonstrated adequate financial strength to procure necessary bonds to complete the project? You also want to make sure that your contract with the owner is coordinated with the general conditions. For example, if you have construction contract administ administration services, um, that has to be enforced by the provisions of the general conditions. Keep the owner informed. If you're not proactive in doing that, the contractor may beat you to the punch and start complaining about you to the owner. They go to classes like this too. And, you know, in our experience, we found that the design professionals are very strong and have a great relationship during the, the planning and the design phase of a project. But unfortunately, once the construction phase starts, um, all of a sudden the contractor is there. And as I said, they go out to breakfast with the owner and they're going to start putting ideas in their head that there are problems with the plans or that somehow you're being delayed and it's, it's not, they're being delayed and it's not their fault, it's your fault. So you need to manage those expectations carefully. And of course, we get to contracts. Um, I love the saying, you get what you negotiate, not what you deserve. You need to understand that if you negotiate an onerous contract with a client, if there are all kind of bad terms in there that make you very nervous, don't assume that they will not be upheld by the courts. Um, there are some times that the courts will say, oh, it's a contract of adhesion, you're a very weak party, and the, con the client was so powerful that you didn't have the ability, you know, this, they're never going to say this about a design professional, but there are some situations where the courts may say that one party is so weak that they didn't have any ability to negotiate or make changes or walk away from a client offered by a more powerful party. I am not aware of any situation where design professionals can take advantage of that concept of a contract of adhesion. The courts are basically going to look at it and say, you had every right to, if you couldn't negotiate changes, to just say no and walk away from it. So once you sign that contract, you're going to have to assume that you're going to be held to the terms of what's in there, good or bad. Um, now, we have other seminars that are going to go into a lot more detail regarding the purposes of professional service agreements. For this presentation, I'm going to focus on what's in that contract that may increase your risk on a specific project um, and also provide you perhaps some insight into the client that you're dealing with. So the first thing you really want to look at is what type of contract is it? Is it an owner-drafted contract? Sometimes they can be reasonable, but one of the things that I do here at Chenner is review a lot of contracts and typically owner-drafted contracts are going to be problematic. And we'll look at some of the provisions that cause those problems. Um, are they willing to use an AIA or an EJCDC contract? Most of you probably know what an AIA document is. Some may not be familiar with the term EJCDC. It stands for Engineers Joint Contract Documents Committee. It's a group of different engineering organizations um, with input from owners and contractors, and even Shinnera sits on this committee that has developed another set of documents that's more engineering oriented than architecture oriented. They're both great sets of documents. Um, we strongly support their use. If you use an unrevised AIA or EJCDC document, you will probably have fewer problems. Um, but if you use them and then your client makes numerous revisions, as I mentioned earlier, then you might have more problems. Some of the things you want to look for in your contract when you're negotiating with a client is you need to have a clearly and sufficiently detailed scope of services. Um, you need to spell out exactly what you're going to do on that project and what services you're not providing, and perhaps what services you are willing to provide as an additional service for an additional fee. I can pretty much promise you if there's any ambiguity 
in the scope of service, you're going to end up doing more work than you're getting paid for, and that's never a good position to be in. You want to make sure the contract contains clear payment terms and fair terms for terminating the contract and for resolving disputes that may result on the project. Um, remember that fee disputes can result in claims. If your client isn't paying you and you file a lawsuit against them for your fees, I would say it's probably about a 90% chance or greater that the client is going to turn around and file a counterclaim saying, well, the reason we didn't pay your fees was because you didn't do an adequate job or you didn't meet the standard of care. Um, if your client isn't paying you, that's a big red flag. So you really need to investigate why is that client unhappy um, and if there's anything that you can do about it you need to deal with it sooner than later. Um, do all the proposed contracts, the owner prime agreement, the prime and sub consultant and the owner contractor agreement, do they all establish clear and distinct responsibilities balanced by the authority to carry out those responsibilities? You want to assign responsibility to the party who's in the best position to handle that responsibility. And you want to avoid having the same responsibility assigned to more than one party, because then you get a lot of finger pointing. Like, I thought the other party was going to do it, so nothing gets done, and, and it slips between the cracks. Um, does the contract fairly allocate, allocate risk and reward, or is the owner trying to shift all of the responsibility to other parties? Will that contract help increase the, or decrease the gap between expectation and outcome that I talked about earlier. Please remember that a well-drafted contract can be your best risk management tool. I would also even go so far as to, you know, say if a dispute arises, if you have a claim and you're dealing with a you know, CNA claims adjuster, the first thing they're going to ask for is a copy of your contract to see what's in that contract that's going to help them defend you or what's in that contract where they're going to say, uh-oh, we've got some big problems and maybe we have to resolve this sooner than later. Um, it will be the first thing your attorney asks for when one is assigned, is they want to see what's in the contract. Um, we get a lot of risk management questions. I'll often get questions about, um, I want to terminate the project. Can I do that? The client wants me to give my documents to the contractor. Do I have to do that? Um, all of these issues that come up, almost invariably, my, my first response is, what does your contract say? And hopefully all of those issues should be addressed, and they would be if you're using one of the standard form agreements. So having that contract is very, very important. Now, some of the key contract provisions that expand common law duties um, include broad indemnifications, express warranties and guarantees, and language that fulfills, that creates unfulfillable expectations. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that the standard of care for design professionals is not to be perfect, is not to guarantee or warrant your work, but it's to provide services to meet an ordinary standard of care, to do what another design professional practicing in the same discipline, in the same location, at the same time, on a similar project, would have done. That is all the law requires of any professional, whether it's an architect or an engineer or an attorney or an insurance broker. It's the same meeting the professional standard of care. It's not perfection. Um, and professional liability insurance that you carry provides coverage for damages to the extent caused by your negligence, negligence being a failure to meet the standard of care. If you get a contract that expands your duties, you're legally going to owe that to your client, but keep in mind you might not have insurance coverage to pay for those damages, and you don't really want to be put in that situation. So let's look at some of these typical ones. The one I probably get asked about the most are indemnifications. Um, You want to look at does that does the indemnification exceed your common law obligation? Um, this is where you see indemnification provisions that might, instead of say that you're going to be responsible for damages to the extent caused by your negligence, it may say um, design professional will indemnify the owner and and contractor sometimes, which you don't want to do, but design professional will indemnify the owner for all claims arising out of the performance of their professional services. So that means anything that you've done, if there's a claim relating to it, you have to indemnify the client for it. You want to make sure that it is up, that it is limited to negligent acts, errors, and omissions, not all of your acts and, you know, and omissions and not all of your performance of professional services. You want to make sure there is no defense obligation. Um, professional liability insurance 
only provides a defense for you, not for your clients. Once liability is determined, assuming such damages are recoverable in the jurisdiction, and that's a big if, then the policy would reimburse the client for expenses, again, to the extent that they were caused by your negligence. Um, there are some times where we might be paying your client's defend cost if they're considered damages in a claim against you, but you really want to stay away from any kind of an obligation that will pro that will push you into providing an upfront defense for your client at a time where we don't even know if, if there was negligence or not against you. So look out for those defense obligations. Um, and again, know the law in your local jurisdiction. In some jurisdictions, the defense obligation can be inferred just from the fact that you've agreed to indemnify. You need to know if you're in one of those, for example, in California, which is where I'm located. And you want to make sure the indemnity is limited to the, to the proportionate extent of your liability. Um, and that's an important thing to have in there. Very often you'll see a contract that says, hey, we're going to be really reasonable. You're going to indemnify us for everything under the sun, but you won't have to indemnify us for our sole negligence. Well, that means you're only going to get out of it if it's proven that the damages were 100% caused by your client. Um, and that's rare. In the construction industry, all these disputes are very complex, and typically various parties contribute in the way of liability. So to have a situation where it's 100% your client's is rare, and if it's not proven that it's 100% your client's responsibility, then even 1% liability on you could result in your owing 100% of the damages. So stay away from those clauses that talk about sole negligence. Um, and that's why we like to see the wording in there that says, basically, you will provide an indemnity to the extent the damages are caused by your negligence. That's the magic words you want to put in an indemnification. You want to look out for some red flag words. Um, warrant, guarantee, those are pretty much the same thing. Um, and they can, remember, they can, warranties and guarantees, which basically is a promise that things are going to be perfect and it's not based on negligence. Um, warranties and guarantees are excluded from coverage under professional liability insurance. And warranties and guarantees can be created without even using the word warrant or I guarantee. It, they can be created by use of what I call the sure words, insure, assure, insure. For example, design professionals shall ensure that the project when complete will be in 100% compliance with the contract documents. Um, that would be a ridiculous promise to make. So if anything went wrong on that project and you issued a promise like that, you would have legal liability, but you probably wouldn't have insurance coverage for it. Um, so stay, you know, none, I say warranty and guarantee is a red flag word. When I review a contract and I see something like professionals' warranties, I stop and I look and I'm very carefully. Now, if all they're asking you to warrant is that you're licensed in the jurisdiction where the project is located, that's fine as long as you really are licensed. If you're providing a warranty that you didn't get any kickbacks to take the job, that's fine too. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to warrant your services or the work of the contractor, okay? Because that's beyond what you have coverage for and it's beyond what the law requires of you. You want to stay away from what I call the absolute words, things like the highest standard of care, um, complete and accurate. No set of documents that I've ever seen is 100% complete and accurate. Highest standard of care basically is elevating that ordinary standard of care to one of perfection. If anything goes wrong on the project, the client can say, I gotcha. Um, fit for its intended purpose, that creates liability for a subjective performance and is more applicable to strict liability for manufacturing than it is for professional services. I mean, how do you define purpose? Fit for its intended purpose. A condo shouldn't leak, so if it leaks, does that make it automatically your fault because that wording is in your contract? Um, this is really a poor fit for construction and it departs from historical norms. Um, the standard of care for professional services should be modified with caution. If a client demands a standard of care that's beyond one that is consistent with due professional skill and care, then it should be measurable and you should receive compensation related to the increased risks, um, the services necessary and the increased risk to assume under such an agreement. Another one you want to stay away from, in my opinion, is time is of the essence. That can be construed to convert any schedule slippage past a stated time constraint into a material breach of the contract. So any minor delay could be used by the client as the basis for a claim for damages or as justification for termination of the agreement. 
remember, the law only requires that you provide services with reasonable promptness based on specific facts and circumstances. And in addition, because professional liability insurance only provides coverage for claims resulting from negligence, claims for breach of contract may result in an uninsurable exposure. Okay, so now you have identified the risk um, and you need to proceed to assess the risk. It's important to distinguish what's probable from what's merely possible. Focusing on the probable is less paralyzing and helps you focus on what's important and helps you achieve a favorable project outcome. So a, re a realistic assessment should consider both the probability, meaning the frequency, and the potential severity, meaning the cost, um, of the various risks. Some problems may occur infrequently, but when they do, the result can be catastrophic. Other problems may occur frequently, but they're of minor consequence. So under a given set of circumstance, the magnitude of risk is a function of the probability of an unfavorable outcome and the severity of the consequences of that outcome. Now, finally, in assessing a given source of risk, you need to consider how much power or authority you have to control the risk. For example, if you're observing the contractor's work for general compliance with the contract documents, you need to be compensated sufficiently to perform those services, um, and you should have to access, have access to the work whenever necessary so you could perform those services. Okay, so this brings us to phase two. You've now hopefully analyzed all the risk. You've done your scale of one to 10. You've figured out what the risks are on this particular project. Um, how are you going to respond? Um, and very basically, there are three risk responses. There's avoidance, transfer, and retain and mitigate. So the first one is fairly obvious. It's avoidance. It's a difficult decision to make. It's not how you make money. It's not something anybody likes to do, but I'm sure that each of you have some experience with a project or a client that you just decided to walk away from deciding that it, there just wasn't enough money in the world to take on that risk. Um, you know, when I used to handle claims, I can't tell you how many times, you know, the lawsuit would be served and the insured would say to me, I knew I shouldn't have worked with that client. I knew this was going to be a problem. So listen to your gut. It probably is very correct in most situations. Um, again, the greatest source of risk is typically a risky client. Um, so listen to your gut. Even if the fees are attractive or the project is particularly interesting or high profile, um, think about who the client is. And beyond the client, perhaps the characteristics of the project are sufficiently outside your experience um, or the nature and high profile of the project could be such that if things go wrong, your reputation would really suffer. Or maybe you're just too busy with other projects. So that's one one, manage, one way to manage risk is just to avoid it. You can also try to manage risk by transferring it. And you do that, of course, through um, buying insurance. You pay a premium, and in return, the insurer pays for the damages, whether they're first-party damages or third-party damages. Um, first-party damages would be things like your auto insurance. If you damage your car, they pay to repair it. Third-party is when somebody makes a claim against you that they've been injured or damaged because of your negligence. Um, there are all different kind of insurance policies that you probably have. I'm going to focus in on professional liability for today. Um, professional liability policies kind of come in two ways. There's the practice policy, which covers all of the projects that you're working on. Um, they're typically one year, or if you're a small firm, you might have a three-year policy. But your policy limit would be a new policy limit every year. And for some projects, you might be able to get a project policy, which is a specific limit of liability that applies just to that one project. Um, if you need to get that, you need to talk to your broker and they'll talk to the underwriter. Project policies are not available for all types of projects. Just keep in, in, in mind that insurance is great and it's obviously very important to have it. It helps you sleep at night, but it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't really take into account if you have a claim or a dispute, all the lost time and effort that you have to put into that deductible payments that you have to make. Every professional liability policy has a deductible. It could range from $1,000 for a small firm. It may go up to a million dollars for a large firm. But your firm has to be aware of that deductible and have something in place to fund the deductible. There may be more than one deductible within a policy period if you have more than one claim made against you. And keep in mind that claims, if you have them, may also increase your premium. Now, another way that you can transfer risk is through your contract. Um, clients often try to 
transfer all of the risk to you and to the contractor. But logically, risk should be transferred to the party who's best able to control the circumstances creating the risk and should be able to insure against that risk. Um, if the risk is extraordinary or not within your clear control, you may want to consider getting an indemnification, which is a written agreement where one party agrees to pay for the liabilities incurred by another party. So it's not unusual, for example, for a contractor to agree to indemnify the owner and the architect or the engineer for worker injuries because you don't have any control over that. Um, you may also be able to get indemnity from the owner uh, if they reuse your contract documents without your involvement. You want to be protected if a claim comes in and you aren't part of that new project that they're working on. Now, you know, getting indemnification from a client is not a guarantee. We often say it's not worth the paper. It's work written on. Um, it may be unenforceable. It may be refused. It may be worthless. Um, and it may cost you money to pursue it. But it's certainly something to consider having in your bag of tricks if you've got a higher risk than normal. You can also try to limit your liability. Um, and that's a provision within the contract specifying the maximum amount of liability that can be incurred. And that's helpful when the risk is out of proportion to the reward. Maybe when an insurance is unavailable or is too expensive or the project is really unique. Um, it may make sense to say to your client, I want to work on this, but the risk is very high. I want to limit my liability to you. And it can be to a dollar amount. It could be to the amount of insurance that you have available at the time this, the claim is settled or any other negotiated amount. It, you know, There's no law that says what it has to be exactly. Just remember that indemnifications and limitations of liability are both very jurisdiction specific. So you need to get legal assistance um, to make sure that what you're doing will be will stand up in the jurisdiction in, in which that's governing this particular project. Um, and there are also some good examples of limitations of liability in the EJCDC documents. Okay, retaining and mitigating risk. This is what we do the most often. It's impossible to avoid all risks, so you need to be prudent about the risk you retain. So you might ask yourself the following questions. What's the benefit to you in accepting this risk? Is the compensation adequate? If the risks are great, the reward should also be great. Keep in mind that even small projects can result in large claims. Um, you know, for example, your help, your help a client get a permit, this, this fee could be very small, but that claim that exposes you to liability could be out of proportion to the service performed and the fee received. So the risk and reward ratio need to be in balance. What is the standard of care being applied to your performance? Is it the highest standard of care? Is there strict liability? which is, again, liability without negligence, that will increase your risk. Are you responsible for an outcome that others are simultaneously responsible for? We talked about that. For example, responsibility for construction site safety. That should better be made, left with the contractor, not with the design team. Have you made financial provisions for the possibility of an adverse result? Do you have a fund to cover uninsurable exposures, including deductibles and lost fees? And lastly, what can you do to mitigate the risk? Can you limit and define obligations by contract? Can you evaluate the skills and experience of your staff? Maybe you need to recruit or add a consultant to help manage the risk. Consider quality management, quality you know, QA, QC, peer reviews, constructability reviews. All of these reviews will help mitigate those damages um, and certainly improve communication and document, document, document. We always talk about the importance of documenting um, your communication so that you've got evidence should a claim arise. And lastly, that brings us to risk control, which involves implementation, monitoring, and managing disputes. Now, it's not enough just to identify the sources of risk and assess their probable impact and develop specific risk response strategies. Um, these strategies have to be implemented and monitored, and they're going to change, and it has to be ongoing. Um, Throughout the project, you have to analyze and respond to new sources of risk created by change conditions or changes in your scope of service. Remember, effective control of risk is only possible with continual risk management planning and replanning. It's essential to remain open and, free, open and have frequent communication with your clients and promptly respond to problems that arise during the project. Risk management depends on quick identification and effective response to these signals. As I said before, if your client isn't paying you, don't ignore that as a red flag. There's a lot of help out there. CNA Claims is available to not only deal with you when a claim is being made against you, but also it assists with pre-claims advice and um, 
pre-claims advice, and, which can help avoid minor issues becoming claims. Remember also that pre-claims advice and circumstance reporting are not counted as claims um, by the underwriters. So when your policy comes up for renewal, if you have a pre-claim or a circumstance that's been reported to CNA, as long as it hasn't turned into a claim, it will not be counted against you. Your premium won't go up because of it. If anything, we like to see those because it shows that you're being proactive and you're trying to avoid having claims and disputes. And let's let's face it, you don't want to have a claim and dispute because they can damage your firm's reputation, which obviously affects your ability to obtain um, new clients and new projects. Sadly, when people are unhappy, they spread the news a lot faster than when they're satisfied. And if you have damage to your reputation, that can affect the loss of future business opportunities. Remember, claims include both insured and uninsured, um, which includes claims within your deductible or claims that may potentially exceed your insurance coverage or other uninsured exposures, some of which um, we've addressed, like if you have a breach of contract or a breach of warranty, um, that may not be covered by the policy. There's a lot of time spent meeting with your claims representatives and attorneys and perhaps being, you know, having to attend depositions, mediations, trials, all of that takes time away from your practice and results in less time to get new clients or to work on current projects. Civil reparations may include losing your license. It's extremely rare, but it can happen. Um, we've seen it happen occasionally. And um, keep in mind too, that although most claims do settle prior to an actual litigation or an arbitration award, they're still very time consuming and very expensive just to get to that point. Defense costs typically exceed the indemnity payments, the indemnity payments being the payments that we make on for your behalf for damages. So in summary, the essence of risk management lies in maximizing the areas where we have some control over the outcome while minimizing the areas where we have absolutely no control. And ways to accomplish this are Select projects that match up with your qualifications, experience, and staffing. Select clients carefully with due diligence. Provide continued training for your staff on contracts and risk management topics. And our Schinner School of Risk Management can help you with that. We have a ton of free courses that have continuing education components that are available all to all of you, to you and your staff with absolutely no cost. If you need information on how to access that, let us know. We can help you with that. Um, you want to provide timely identification, management, and resolution of problems. Avoiding a client complaint or potential liability problem will not make it go away. Do not be an ostrich. It does not help. <laughs> um, think about contractual risk allocation provisions, the ones we talked about, like a limitation of liability or an indemnification. They're helpful, but they alone are not the answer. And similarly, although insurance is an essential risk transfer me mechanism, it's not a substitute for a comprehensive risk management program. So for more information, we urge you to visit our website. Here's a look at our new website. Um, if you haven't already established an account, you should do so. It, you can fill out the form and just write down um, under need assistance, you can create an account. It will take probably anywhere from two hours to 24 hours to get it. And then you have access to the continuing your education bucket there, the first one, which has all those free courses. Um, you can also look at claim studies, management advisories, contract language and commentary, and our past webinars. Um, so there's a lot that's in there that can help you.